Hey guys, so haven't made a video in a little while. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk through the gear that I'm gonna be using for pike over the winter. Um, haven't been fishing since sort of September time. Um, and my next trip is to Pittsford um, this coming weekend. Uh, me and my dad are gonna try and beat our pike PBs um, out on the reservoir there. So I'm gonna talk through um, the gear and kind of tactics. Um, most of the kind of specialist gear for pike is more about fish care and fish handling um, but we'll get to that I'll start with the exciting stuff um, we'll start with rods um, so rod wise um, normally you'd probably be looking at a nine weight or a ten weight for pike I personally fish eight weights because that's what I've got um, but I've also built a uh, glass eight weight rod um, specifically for pike I've got a Fast action carbon rod. Um, this is the first rod that I ever built. Um, I build my own rods mostly, but yeah, this was the first one I ever built. It's a bit ropey um, cosmetically, but it does the job. Fish this mainly for bass, but it works great for pike as well. Um, nine foot, eight weight, fast action. Um, it will chuck, um, you know, decent sized flies. But if you're wanting to chuck really big flies, then a nine weight may suit you better or even a 10 weight. You don't necessarily need a nine weight or a 10 weight to be able to fight a big pike. It's just more about being able to chuck big flies a long way if that's what you want to do. I've also got the S-Glass um, fly rod that I've built. This one is built specifically for pike, so it's got the, the longer um, fighting butt on it for when you're fighting a larger fish. Um, I've also got some rec guides on this one uh, which are nice and robust um, for you know when you're sort of kicking around in a boat or dropping it on the floor and while you're unhooking a fish don't want someone treading on it um, just means it's going to last a bit longer hopefully so both of my rods are eight weights so to match that I've got eight weight reels so for pike fishing I carry different lines for different situations so I've got a floating line, this is an eight weight line. Um, it's a airflow forge. It's quite a good line for casting bigger flies. I find it does a good job casting bass flies and it casts bigger pipe flies as well as well. Where would I fish a floating line? Mainly rivers or canals, sort of shallower water. If you're fishing a river and it's shallow, floating line get, lets you mend the line, control the line a bit better. Whereas a sinking line is gonna get sort of like towed away and you'll get a big bow and slack in the line whereas with a floating line you can mend the slacks um, keep contact with your uh, fly i might just fish a regular leader on this of i don't know sort of six foot of um, fluorocarbon if i was fishing a river or a canal um, or i'm thinking about getting some um, sinking airflow poly leaders to attach to this to help get the fly down quicker particularly in rivers when your fly hits the water takes a long time to sink um, so you want it to get down before it's away from where the pike might be sat. Next up I've got uh, an intermediate line. This line I actually bought for um, bat sea bass fishing. It's a airflow uh, 40 plus intermediate so it casts well and it casts big flies pretty well too. Um, this one sinks at about an inch and a half per second so it's going to be more appropriate for river fishing and canal fishing but Equally, it'll be good for fishing in the upper layers on a reservoir, um, like from the boat at Pittsford. I'll have this one set up um, for if I want to fish in the upper sort of 10 foot of water. <clears throat> and then finally, I've got a, a DI7. So DI7 sinks at seven um, inches per second. This is a super fast sink line. Um, this one's going to be fishing for fishing deep in the reservoir. Um, I have tried it on the river and I do find that at range where there's any flow it is tricky um, to maintain contact with your fly. Um, that and it will just get wrapped up in snags as well in the flow. Um, but it's ideal for fishing from a boat um, on a reservoir. Real wise you don't have to be too picky. Um, this is just an old Sierra, um, Akuma Sierra 8-9 um, weight. It's not really designed for pike, it's not got a particularly large arbor, but it was cheap as chips and it holds the line. Um, pike fishing, you're not often gonna be on the reel 
fighting them with the drag, even big fish, you're going to be able to manage um, stripping line in. Um, this reel is um, an Airflow V3. I bought this one more for salt water, but because it's an eight weight, it means I can go from bass fishing to pike fishing. Um, so that's got better drag on it, but it's all sealed for salt water and stuff. But for pike fishing, just a, a reel with a half decent drag on it is going to be perfectly fine. You don't need to spend loads of money. Okay, so that's rods and reels. The next piece of the puzzle is leaders. Okay, so in here, I've got my leader wallet. So I carry my leaders in a wallet like this. Just makes it easier for organization and storage. My pike fly leaders are already made up with a piece of fluoro attached. So depending on whether I'm fishing a floating line um, or a sinking line, I'll use a different length of leader. So this one's quite a short one for a sink, a sink line. So I've got um, perfection loop on the end of a piece of fluorocarbon. It's only about two foot long to my wire trace, which is about a foot and a half. Um, I make my traces up by tying the fluorocarbon to a swivel and then tying a single strand um, nickel titanium uh, 35 pound wire to the swivel as well. And then I put a bit of heat shrink clear um, tubing over that just to, because a swivel creates a hinge point and when you're casting, you don't want it to kind of like wrap around itself. So I just put that bit of clear tubing on there to keep it a bit stiffer so that it doesn't tangle so easily. And then on the business end, we've got a twist lock um, attachment um, tied to the wire. Again, I've put a little bit of clear um, shrink tube over that just to stop it from being a hinge point, uh, same as with the, with the fluorocarbon end. It's not particularly supple. Um, I know a lot of people advocate that you have as supple a wire as possible. Um, I've fished with this nickel titanium stuff for over 10 years um, lure fishing. Um, so for flies, it's gonna be a bit different, but it's worked for me. Um, lure wise, I've used really short single strand traces. You know, it's quite stiff, but even with tiny little lures that you're trying to pr present with finesse, um, even for like trout and perch, I'll have a little trace on to protect me in case I get a big pike on, but it doesn't stop the, the smaller, more finicky fish from, from biting. So. I've never had any issues with it. Um, it's really strong stuff and yeah, I, it lasts as well because it doesn't kink very easily. So if you get it stuck on a snag or I don't know, or you get a big fish, um, sort of like really sort of hammer it, it's, it's gonna come out just as good after you've unhooked the fish and you can land plenty of fish on one leader and it's gonna last, you're gonna get your money's worth out of it basically. So once you've got your leader on, um, obviously you're gonna need some flies. Um, this is something that's a bit more new to me because um, I only technically started pike fly fishing at the start of this year. Um, so I've been tying um, a few and I've, I've bought a few flies. So got sort of like regular kind of bait fish patterns um, just on a single hook. I've got some smaller bait fish patterns that have a tiny little plastic disc on the front just to create a bit of disturbance. Um, my thinking behind that is that the movement in the water that will cause will help the pike pick it up with their lateral line. So they're not relying just on sight, they're sensing the vibration as well. Um, how well that works, I'm not sure, but we'll find out. Then I've tied some sort of copies of uh, Paul Clydesdale's stealth jig. So these are tied sideways on the hook rather than upright. So it looks like a kind of a, a dying fish bobbing up and down. There's a tiny little bit of bead chain on the front just to help with the jigging motion. Um, and yeah, I've, they just looked like a really good idea to me. So I've tied a few of those. Then on the bigger end of things, uh, got these tied up by Hector Rodriguez. These are his um, Chernobyl newts. I just thought they looked immense. Um, and the like cone head on the front's gonna help with like moving the water around, helping the pipe pick up that um, vibration. They've got a rattle in as well um, for sound. Big um, waggle tail. I mean, it's got this has got everything. Um, and I've got a couple of those from Hector. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, he even sent me this one as well, which is a really big bait fish imitation that looks great. 
and then I've tied a couple of my own of those. I've um, got a nice fire tiger pattern there. So variations in colour. Personally, um, I guess from like my experience of lure fishing as well as fly fishing, um, colour wise, I'd say you need three kind of basic colours. Black's going to be good for low light coloured water. Um, and then kind of natural patterns for clear water. Um, and then something in the middle, uh, like a f I guess like the fire tiger, brighter colours are going to be good for coloured water, but also darker conditions. But then they also work as an attractor in, in good visibility. So yeah, those sort of three areas of colour are going to cover the bases for you. Um, something else that I'd never leave home without when I'm bass fishing or pike fishing is uh, stripping guards. Um, most of the time if I don't fish with these I wind up getting the skin cut through on my finger where I've been pulling the line across my finger all day um, and it stings. So I always wear stripping guards just because when, particularly when it's cold Things like that are just going to really irritate you. Um, something I forgot to mention about my leader is the reason I use the twist locks is because you can just twist the fly on and off. There's no like awkward clip to have to undo. And when your fingers are cold and numb, it's really hard to undo. Um, so it's just anything like that just to make life easier because pike fishing is mostly done when it's really cold. So you've got to think your fingers don't work as well when it's below 15 degrees. So um, yeah, just something to think about. Then also, um, boat or bank fishing, I'd use a line tray. Um, this is the best 25 quid I've ever spent for fly fishing gear. Um, just having the line around your feet when you're on the bank, it's going to be in the mud, it's going to be in the sat grit, the sand, um, you know, whatever wrapped up round foliage. Having a line tray just makes it so much easier um, to fish and not be bogged down by that kind of thing. And also, you know, if you get a big fish that's trying to take quite a bit of line, it comes out of the tray a lot easier than it does coming unwrapped from your feet or plants or whatever. So yeah, highly recommend a line tray. Okay, so back onto the topic of fish care. <clears throat> this is where things get a bit more specialized. Um, this is, more of a lightweight unhooking mat. So this is good for if I'm, you know, walking along the bank of a river or a canal, it folds up nice and small, clips onto my bag, I can just unclip it, chuck it on the floor, um, and I've got somewhere safe to unhook the fish. Um, same in the boat. Um, you, If you're in a boat, ideally, you want a nice big unhooking mat um, the thicker the better because a boat is a hard surface, have that in the bottom of the boat and it just means that you can lift the fish straight in and it's ready to be unhooked and photographed quickly. Okay and then also on the subject of fish care, so having the right tools for the job. So I have a really long nose pair of uh, decent unhooking pliers, long pair of curved forceps and a pair of side cutters. Um, sometimes it's just easier to cut the hook as close as you can to where it's in and then just remove the lure that way. Also, you're going to need a nice big landing net. Um, this one isn't particularly ideal for bank fishing because if I want to move around with it put together, it's a bit of a parachute um, in the wind. It makes it quite difficult to walk around, but you've got to have the right tools for the job. Um, so yeah, nice big net, uh, rubber mesh, uh, knotless. Um, yeah, it's gonna be what you need. Last thing is a pair of Polaroids. Um, I think just for fly fishing in general, glasses are essential just to protect your eyes as much as anything, but they also help you see into the water if they're polarized. Um, this time of year, I mean, I need to get some myself, um, some polarized uh, glasses with low light lenses that aren't quite so dark. Um, just means that you can wear them um, and fish later into the day and still be able to see whereas these ones are probably by about four o'clock I'll be struggling to see because it'll be getting a bit too dark. So it's not a comprehensive list of everything um, 
but yeah, hope that gives you a kind of an idea of the kind of gear you'll need. Um, like I said, in terms of rods and reels, you don't need anything specialist. Um, it's just got to be up to the job of casting bigger flies and heavier lines. The main thing is that your leader is strong. So, you know, 35, 40 pound fluorocarbon, sort of minimum. Same for your trace wire. Um, personally, I like the single strand nickel titanium. It's strong, it's knottable. Um, you don't have to use the crimps, which can pull free um, if they're not crimped properly. Good hooks on your flies, and then make sure you've got the right tools to unhook the fish. Um, decent net, decent landing mat, and you'll be good to go. So yeah, I hope that was uh, helpful. Any questions, um, leave them in the comments and I will do my best to, to get back to you. And uh, yeah, tight lines, and I'll see you in the next one.